quickly. Well, we have an example of that today in, in our passage. And turn with me to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1. And while you're doing that, I just want to thank the mothers out there. And in honor of Mother's Day, I chose this passage. A, a, a great godly woman, Hannah, her great example, not only as a, as a mama want to be, but also just as a sister in Christ for all of us to, to glean from her great example. And so I thought it would be not just appropriate for, for us uh, to honor the mothers that are out there, but also uh, just for us to, to grow in our, in our own faith in prayer. Uh, and I'll share with you a little bit more about that later. But 1 Samuel chapter 1 Verse 1. Now there was a certain man from Ramathim, Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. And when they came, the Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And it happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her so she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you not weep? Why, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better than ten sons? Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat of the doorpost of the temple of the Lord, and she greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant, but that will give thy maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come to his head. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the wonderful mothers out there who have not only birthed us, not only raised us, Lord, but raised the next generation of believers in the truth and in the Word. Lord, we're so thankful for mamas, so thankful for the blessing that they are, and so thankful for this Word this morning. May it truly uh, transform our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to this passage and we come to Hannah. One of the things that we see again, just like last week, we see a real example of a real person. This is a real story. And another true event that, that we can glean from. And why is that important? Well, it's important because these aren't just make-believe superheroes. Right? They're not just make-believe people who, who, who really don't have feelings, who who, you know, these situations are, are, are make-believe. No, th this is a real-life situation. This is a real person who struggles with, with, with a real problem. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to, to learn from Sister Hannah. Now, she is, you know, like stereotypical most women she has that that maternal desire that that God had placed within her to desperately want a child she desperately wanted to have her own child and and, and to be tender and soft and sensitive and, 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 and nurturing with 
right? Dad kind of has that, you know, just the facts. It's all business. You know, let's get to work mentality. Where, where moms have, you know, the, the touchy feelings, right? Which is good. It's good to have that balance. When, uh, you know, little Johnny runs and falls and scrapes his knee and, you know, dad looks at him and says, get up. You know, put some dirt in it. Move on. And mama gives him a hug and a little kiss. Well, both are right. And both are good. And so we, we want that balance. Well, here we see Hannah and she, she, she has a husband. She, she feels incomplete. And that's not to suggest that just because you don't have children, you're incomplete. But for Hannah personally, this was her personal desire. And so, what does she do? Where does she go? Well, that's where the story begins. And so today we're going to see four insights that we can glean from Hannah's prayer. Four, four lessons from a, a hopeful mama. The first one, and it's on the back of the bullets, and the first one is motives for praying. The second one is methods for praying. The third insight is the master's answer for praying. And then the fourth is the mindful appreciation from prayer. But before we dive in, I have a challenge for you. I have a serious challenge. And here's the challenge. And it's one that, that I had to, to, to deal with in, in my life, in my spiritual life. And that is, do you believe? Do you really believe? Not only do you really believe in prayer, but I would suggest if you don't believe in prayer, do you believe in God? Now let that sink in for a second. If you believe in God, then you will believe in praying to that God. But if you don't believe in God, then why would you pray to that God? And if you're not praying to God, then do you believe? And so that's part of what I want to challenge you with as we, as, as we work through this, this, this chapter. So what is prayer anyway? What is prayer? Well, Psalm 37 gives us kind of a little, little insight into you know, some of the... The, the guidelines or, or, or just the premises of what prayer is. And it, I, I think it starts with this. In Psalm 37, we see, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the Lord and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He will do it. And He will bring Force your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way because of a man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. So what is prayer? Prayer is, is that alignment with our desires and God's desires. It's our alignment in trusting with Him, delighting in Him, committing and not fretting because of our, our, our full faith and, and relationship with Him. We see prayer then as this wonderful opportunity to bring our will into alignment with God's. Now, now notice we're, we're, we're not trying to bring God's will into alignment with ours, Right? We want to be in line with what He wants, what He desires. Prayer is a great opportunity for us to demonstrate who and what we actually trust in. Do we trust in ourselves? Our government? Or do we trust in God? Prayer then is the, the speaking, the communication with God which ultimately cultivates a relationship with God. Now again, consider your relationship with God if you're not in prayer with God. That'd be like being in a, in a marriage relationship and not communicating with your spouse. Well, I'm in, I'm in a marriage and, and I love them. I just don't talk to them. 
Well, why do we get that in human relationships, but we don't get that with our Master? Oh, I believe in God. I just don't ever talk to Him. I just don't ever, ever humble myself before His throne. And so the first insight that we want to look at is, is some motives for praying. Motives for praying. Verse 1 starts off with the, the, the setting. There's this, 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 this family, right? And this, this man, Elkanah. And, and, and Elkanah had two wives. Verse 2, he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Peninah. Penion, there's a tongue twister for you. Penina had children. One of his wives has children. Another wife, Hannah, doesn't have any. Well, it's not just a matter of bad luck, poor circumstances. We learn even deeper, verse 5. But Hannah, but Hannah, who Elkanah loved, but the Lord had closed her womb. Now, did you hear that? Don't miss that. The Lord closed her womb. This is a divine, sovereign, providential plan by God. Now, it may sound great to us, because we know the end of the story. It may sound great to us because, well, we're just reading along. But you have to picture yourself being Hannah. You have to picture yourself being in her situation where she desperately wants a child and God closes her womb. Well, that sounds harsh. That sounds... That sounds rough. And not only that, not only does God close her womb, but her rival has children. Verse 6, her rival, and by the way, this idea of, of polygamy, this idea of having two wives in this historical narrative, this is factual, this is true, this is what happened, but it's not what's prescribed biblically. Right? The Bible never gives, gives a prescription for, for having multiple wives. The, the, in fact, the Bible clearly states that there's to be one wife, one husband. That's the way God designed it. So we designed it at the very, very beginning with Adam and Eve. One man, one woman, male and female, married to one person. But what we see here is, yes, polygamy is practiced, because the people are, are, are yielding to the culture around them. Again, that's something that we have to be very careful of. We don't follow the way of the world just because the world is doing it that way. Just because the, the world says, well, if you have wealth, then, then it's okay to have multiple wives. No. Or even as conjecture, maybe he has two wives because Hannah is barren. Either way, there's no excuse. Polygamy is, is not okay, but it is a, a, truism, a truism of what's happened. And so the Lord has closed Hannah's womb. Now we also know just from reading our Bibles that, that, that God, sovereignly in control, there are things that happen that we don't always like or understand, right? Joseph to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And so sometimes we don't, we don't understand why Sarah was without child with Abraham, but God had a plan, right? We don't understand why, why Elizabeth was, was barren until she had John the Baptist. God had a plan. And so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing that, that we see how God uses the opening and the closing of, of the womb at His discretion, at His pleasure. Sometimes He opens a womb even before there's a relationship. Remember Mary and Jesus? And so God is on display and showing His power, His control, and His authority with the womb. But Hannah's got to live the life. 
And so verse 6, her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly and irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And it happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. So not only does Hannah have this, this aching desire, but she's got a vicious, mean rival. I mean, she's got somebody right, right there pr- provoking her, teasing her. And, and while she's sincerely in, in agony, and by the way, emotion is okay, right? Jesus wept too. Emotion's okay. It's okay that, that Hannah's emotional about that, about this. It's okay that, that Hannah has real feelings. What's not okay, she's got somebody standing beside her standing beside her, not one time, not twice, or day after day, year after year. Again, don't rush past these passages. Stop down and think about that for a second. Have you ever had a problem? Have you ever had a, a, a trial in your life? So you, you have a trial, but then you also have a person provoking you about that trial. I venture to say we've all had trials, but we usually don't have somebody that, that's pressing us. And then maybe one time, maybe for a season, but year after year, that. This is a major trial for Hannah. And yet here she is going, beseeching the Lord. What's her response? What's her response? Even though she's got a husband, verse 8, then, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And, and, and why don't you eat? Why, 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 are you, why are you fasting over this? Why is your heart so sad and broken? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And so he kind of gives that, you know, Job's friends answers, right? When Job's friends come together and they don't know exactly what to say. You know, we've, we've had friends like that or been in situations like that. And it's like, so, so here's her husband's, her husband's answer and response. Do I not love you enough? Is, is not our relationship strong enough? You know, don't, or don't we have a good thing going? And then, you know, maybe another one of her friends goes, oh, Hannah, don't worry about it. We, we just go adopt. Adopt, Hannah. No, no big deal. Adoption's great. Adoption's godly. Adoption's a wonderful thing. There's plenty of people out there that need adopting. And then another friend comes along and, you know, the, the, the tough one goes, oh, Hannah, buck up. Get tough. Deal with it. Right? Another friend comes over and gives her a hug and they cry and cry together. And so we all have, like, these different people who speak differently and here's her husband and he's trying to be sympathetic he's trying to be gentle he's trying to be a loving husband but it's not working verse 9 then Hannah then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord And she, greatly distressed, greatly distressed, we can't emphasize that enough, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. When you are greatly distressed, pray to the Lord. That's a great start. And that's where Hannah starts. That's where Hannah goes. She's got a great husband, but you know what? she's going to go directly to the Lord God Almighty Himself. And she prays to the Lord and weeps bitterly. This is not casual. This is not just ho-hum. Let's check the box of prayer. Because, you know, on, on Hannah's prayer list, right, to have children is, is you know, it's, it's always there, right? It's always in the box. All right, well, you know, Take care of Hannah's prayer first. Hannah, you know, that's what we pray. No, she is weeping bitterly. This this is like a a raw emotional pain. Like today's the first day it happened. Right? That's that, that weeping bitterly. 
agonizing over it. And so she goes before the throne of God, goes before the Lord, and she makes a vow. She makes a vow. Well, that's interesting. So her motive for praying in grief is a, is a great desire to have a child. That, that's her motive. And there's lots of motives for praying. There's a ton of motives for praying. The key is to actually start the process. right? Ask, seek, knock, Matthew 7. Whatever the, the reason, whatever your motive for praying is, you, you have to actually do it. And so we move on to the, to the next piece, which is, well, what is the method then of this prayer? And what is the method that we can, can glean from Hannah? What does Hannah do? And, and, and I'll pause here for a second. I, I mentioned that I was struggling with, with prayer at a time. In fact, it was the time when I first enrolled in seminary. I, I had two stints in seminary. First was in the beginning of our marriage, and, and, and I was there for a semester, and then we had twins on the way. I thought, oh, I'll take a semester off, and it took 16 years to get back, okay? Which was all good and great in the Lord's timing. But in that first stint, one of my, somebody had asked me last week about the heroes of the faith, and I, I didn't mention him because nobody knows who he is, but he's still one of my heroes. Uh, Alex Montoya, he's a, a great preacher in, in Southern California. He's one of the professors at the Master's uh, Seminary. And we're in prayer class, and we're, it's a class, right? Prayer class. And, and we're praying, and as we're discussing our prayers and discussing the process, I make a statement that is, is just raw and honest and I, and, I, and I say something to the effect of, you know, I struggle praying because I don't know, it just doesn't seem like the Lord answers most of my prayers. And I had a prayer that I'd been praying for years and it just goes unanswered and unanswered and unanswered. And so I was a bit deflated with that and, and honestly, I, I was really struggling. And he looked at me and he shook his head and goes, it's because you're pragmatic. You just want what you want. And if you don't get what you want and get your way, then you don't do it. It's like, I thought he would be a little more gentle, you know? Maybe explain it, you know, go some Bible verses. And he just like cut me, you know, right in half. And he was 100% true. I wanted what I wanted, when I wanted it, how I wanted it, in the right time of what I wanted it. And it was then and there that I realized I'm wrong. I need to repent. I need to change. I need to grow. And, and I really didn't know how I could quote you Bible verses. I could quote you Matthew 6. Okay, you know, the Lord's Prayer, right? And I could quote you the Ackerman, right? We, we adore God first. We confess our sins. We, we thank God. And then we have the supplication, the asking part, right? I could do the Acts thing. But it was just a... It was, it was box checking. It was ceremonial. It was religiosity. And I realized I need to learn how to pray. And that's when I started. And I went to the first page. I, I like doing this. When I want to understand something, I, I just start at the beginning and just read through the Bible. And I wanted to see every single prayer that was in the Bible. Real people, real time, real issues. How did they pray? Stand up, sit down, eyes open, eyes closed. Whatever way it was. I wanted to know how they prayed, how God answered it. I wanted the pattern. I'm, I'm going to do, do the system. I'm going to implement the system. I'm going to check all the box, and I'm going to be a good prayer warrior. And I learned that's not how prayer works. There's not one way, one system. There's not one method. And so when we see here in Hannah's method or Hannah's pattern, we see the first thing she does is she makes a vow to the Lord. Verse 11, and she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant, but wilt give thy maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of my life, and a razor shall never come to his head. And she so say, wait a minute, you can't make deals with God. 
Well, it, 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 it's, not the, it's not a pragmatic deal she's making. What, he's, what she's saying is, is, is Lord, I promise you. I, I, I promise you. And she does it saying, Lord, calling herself a maidservant, right? It's a little indicator of what she thinks of herself. I'm just a slave. You're the master. You're the Lord of the universe. You have all the power, all the authority. And I'm coming to you humbly before your throne. And if you were to so bless me with the child, I will give him right back to you. I will dedicate him to the Lord's service, to the priesthood. Wow. Not only that, I won't put a razor to his head. This is a, a little insight into the, the, the Nazarene vow. That they would make these vows in the Old Testament, a vow to, it's a voluntary dedication to God. It usually has a specific time frame. And it has certain restrictions or requirements, and the Nazarene vow isn't always the exact same. But she is, is fully dedicating this child to the Lord. And how does she go about this? Through prayer. She goes before the throne of God and says, okay, Lord, this is, this is what my request is and this is what I'll do. But here's, here's the thing that struck me when I was going through my journey of, of, of studying and looking at prayers and really looking into the, the depths and the heart and the insight of the prayer. And maybe you see it here and maybe you missed it, but I missed it over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden, one day it popped out and just right in front of me in big neon lights and sign and I never saw it before. And it's like, do you know what Hannah did? She prayed for a miracle. Wait a minute, you can't do that. I'm a good Baptist. I'm not. I'm not charismatic. I'm a, you know. I'm very conservative, right? We, we're just. We, we we don't. We don't pray for miracles. Hannah did. And by the way, as I started going through the Word and seeing, there are many prayer warriors who pray for miracles. And I'm not talking about you know undocumented miracles or things you know that that are outrageous. I'm talking about recognizing your position, your place in relationship to God. God made Hannah barren. God closed her womb. Verse 5, Lord God, I want You to reverse Your sovereign work. She's not complaining. She's not blaming. She's just beseeching the Lord. Lord, can You miraculously change this. Wow. I asked last week, when was the last time you prayed for a miracle? Not something that's like, you know, really, really hard and highly unlikely, like the Mariners winning a World Series. <laughs> Crazy, yes. Miraculous, no. But I mean a real miracle. How many times have you been there and you, you're looking at somebody who you love desperately and they don't know the Lord and, and you're sitting there going, it's not going to happen. Not them. They're too far. They're too God. You're, what you're lacking is the understanding and the clarity. Say, Transformation of the soul and the mind is a miraculous event, Right? And that's really what we're asking for, that the Lord would miraculously change that person's heart. And so Hannah goes boldly before the throne and asks for this miracle. It's, it's beautiful. It's not about you know, how many times a day she prays. It's not about, uh, about whether she's standing up or sitting down. No, it's, it's about praying without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 What does that look like? Year after year after year. Right? She doesn't give up. She doesn't give up hope. She keeps going back to the throne of God. Verse 12, Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. 
Now, now you've got to know that back in the day, it was pretty common. It's kind of like today. If you were to go to Israel and you go to the weeping wall and you would see people praying at the wall, they would actually be audible. You would hear their prayers. That was more the tradition that you would say it out loud. Well, she's not saying it out loud, so she's just kind of like, you know, and Eli's looking at her going, uh, something's going on over there. So Eli thought she was drunk. And that's not appropriate. We see that very clearly. Verse 16, only a worthless woman would be a drunkard. Back to verse 14. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk but put away your wine from you? But Hannah answered said, no, my Lord. I, I, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Look at her method is to pray unceasingly. Her, her method is to plea before the Lord. Her, her method is to ask for the miraculous. Her, her, her method is to pour out her soul. Not to just pray robotically. It's not robotic. It's not a religious system. It's personal. It's emotional. It's an emotional interaction with the divine that we are even allowed to be able to go boldly before the throne of God. Is, it's an amazing blessing. And there's not just one method, but our core of our method is the, the respect that we have for God. It's even more importantly, the confidence that we have. Do you have the confidence to pray for that miracle? Well, that can't happen, so I won't pray for it. That's pragmatic. You pray boldly before the throne. And if you do so with right motives, as James 4.3 says, then, then, then your prayers can be answered. And if you do so with humility and sincerity... As Matthew 6, 5 through 15 outlines, in humility with sincerity. It, doesn't be, it, it, it isn't more, more humbling or, or sincere than Hannah's example that we see here. Well, the third insight we see is the master's answer for praying. The master's answer for praying. <clears throat> Then they arose early in the morning, verse 19, and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. She said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him and he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. And Elkanah, her son, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she was weaned. So we see the Lord's answer to her prayer and we see it rather quickly. But we like that, right? We like the quicker answer. We don't like the 400-year answer, right? When Israel was, was in bondage for 400 years and they're screaming out to the Lord, where are you? Come get us. Save us. You got about 200 more years. Get back to me. Well, we don't like those timelines. We like quick answers. We like answers now. Well, Hannah has relations and she gives birth. She has this uh, amazing gift that God gives her. And, and, and in due time, Hannah conceived. And what does she say? Because I have asked Him of the Lord. Who gets credit? Who gets glory? Who gets honor? God, God, and God. God gets the credit, the glory, and the honor. By the way, if you're familiar with Hannah, in 1 Samuel 2.21, 2, you'll notice Hannah goes on to have five more children. 
the Lord completely opens up her womb completely. But at this moment, it's just the one. And so the Lord blesses her. And after nine months, she has the child. And Elkanah is getting ready to take the household up to offer the yearly sacrifice to pay his vow right? The day of atonement to take the whole family up to make the sacrifices so the whole family is, is saved and forgiven. He's going up there and they're faithful and they're, they're a religious family. He's going to do it. And, and Hannah's got the baby, the miracle baby Samuel with her. But Hannah says, I'm not going to go up. I will not go up until the child is weaned. Well, how long is that going to be? Well, traditionally that could be two to three years. And part of the reasoning for that is I'm going to give my baby up forever. Give me my two or three years, I'll give you the rest. Right? And so she's fully committed to her vow. Now, that's not a light thing to consider. It's one thing to go before the Lord and the Lord, I, I, I'll make a vow. If you do this, then I'll do that. God does this and then, well, not so fast. I know I promised that I would stop doing X, Y, Z, but it's kind of hard. So, eh. See, that's the kind of deals we like to make. We make deals. We don't make vows. That's the difference between a deal and a vow. A vow is a promise, a covenant that you make before the Lord and you do not break it. And this is her child. This is the baby that she's desired all her life for, has been broken over, and she now is touching and holding and feeling that baby. I know what this feels like now. As a grandfather, as a new grandfather. And to have your little grandbabies in your arms and their cute little faces and to have to watch them go away is not a great feeling. And if I had the option and I had the choice and said, sons, you're not allowed to move, you're not allowed to take the grandbabies, I would do it. Not allowed, not going. Well, I understand, Hannah, is that like, here's, can we make a different deal, God? Can we make a different deal where he honors and obeys and, and is faithful to you, but he does that in my home? No, Hannah is faithful. Hannah is faithful. It, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Well, the master answers her prayer and answers her prayer directly but the, man, the master doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want, does he? And again, when you study the Bible and you study the totality of Scripture, you start seeing some examples of, well, I knew this guy, Brother Moses. Remember Brother Moses? Pretty good guy. And Moses, who leads the Israelites out of Egypt and is leading the Israelites to the promised land, that guy doesn't get to go into the promised land. Why? Consequences for disobedience. Right? There's a consequence for disobedience. And so Moses is not going to be allowed to go into the promised land, but he's going to be allowed to see the promised land. So he goes before the Lord, Lord, please. Right? You know, in the scales of justice and life, I, I've done way more good things than bad things. Can, can, can I step foot in the promised land? Can I, you know, spend the night in the promised land, a, a week in the promised land? And what's the answer in, in, that we see in Deuteronomy 3.25? No. No. Well, we, again, we don't like no. But, but the Lord knows. The Lord knows what's best for us and we have to trust and have faith and have confidence in the Lord's answer. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not now. Sometimes the answer is yes and it happens fast. But we don't know. But it's up to the Master to answer the prayer and it's up to us to, to go and ask and pray, and be in relationship. 
not for the answer. Again, that's the pragmatic way. We don't go before the throne of God because we want stuff. God is not Santa Claus. The problem we have today in the church and in the world is that Jesus is presented as, as the gift giver. He's Santa Claus. He's going to give you everything you ever wanted and more. Let's make a deal. That is not the God of the Bible. He will save you from sins. Stuff is a whole other matter. Well, the fourth insight that we see with Hannah is a mindful appreciation. A mindful appreciation from the process of praying. You know who's blessed when you pray? You are blessed by praying. It's just like being in that relationship with your spouse. You know who's blessed when you put in and you pour into the relationship? You're blessed when you put and pour into the relationship. Well, verse 24, Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. Although the child was young, and they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as my soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here bes beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked for of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Wow. What a pattern. What a woman. What a mom. Hannah maintains her, her vow. He ma she maintains her, her, her promise. She's faithful. And she takes this, this, this miracle child back to Eli. Now remember, Eli and her, they had had that inter interaction earlier in the, in, the, in the passage when Eli thinks she's drunk, right? That was the last time Eli saw her. Last time Eli sees her, she's off in the corner, you know, mumbling to herself, and he's like, oh, I don't know. It's, it's, she's got problems, right? The next thing you know, here's Hannah with child in hand going, hey, you remember me? I was the crazy one over there that you thought drunk that was praying for the miracle, and guess what? I got some news for you. Here's the miracle, baby. The Lord has given me my prayer petition, my answer. The Lord has blessed me. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Again, she testifies to the power of the Lord. Giving Him all glory, honor, and praise. That's what it's all about. It's not about her husband. It's not about her. It's about God. And so God gets the glory. God gets the honor. God gets the praise. And here we are 4,000 years later still praising God for this miraculous event. Amen? And we are blessed by this miraculous event. And we can learn how to pray with power and vigor because of this event. And we walk out the door giving God the glory, honor, and praise because there is power in prayer not because of us, because of what God can do and how He does it. I, I, I can't express it any better than just, again, reading God's Word. If you want to understand a mindset, a, a mindful appreciation, if you want to see inside the mind of somebody who's authentically grateful for God's answer to prayer, well, we have it right here in chapter 2. Because here's Hannah now. She's just given her child as dedication. And what's the response after that? 1 Samuel 2, Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. And there is no one like the holy Lord, indeed, there is no one beside thee, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. 
Those who were full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease no hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven. Here she is. Look, even the barren God has power over, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes rich and poor. He brings low. He exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and to inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And He set forth the world on them and He keeps the feet of the godly ones. But the wicked ones are silenced in darkness for not by might shall a man prevail those who contend with the Lord will be shattered, and against them He will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the, of the earth, and He will give strength to His King and will exalt the horn of His anointed. This is someone convinced. This is someone who has seen the power and the glory of the Lord, and you can just hear her heart just shouting the exaltation and the praise to the Lord God Almighty. What an absolutely beautiful example to us. From the beginning, she is just mercilessly just agonizing over the, 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 the desire to have a child when the Lord has closed her womb. She remains faithful and steadfast year after year not turning her heart or eyes from the Lord, but instead turning directly to Him, giving herself, vowing before the throne of God to return that child in obedience, returning that child. And she is the one who goes on ever after giving glory, honor, and praise as a first, as a first line eyewitness testimony to the greatness of who the Lord God Almighty is. Because our God is a personal, personal Lord. That's our King and Savior. That's the one who dies on the cross to pay the price for our sins. That's who our God is. He's a good God. He's an awesome God. And if you want to know about the Lord's mercy and tender love, read your Old Testament. And if you don't understand it that way, you've been reading it wrong. Because God is merciful. But you've got to read the whole story. You can't stop at verse 5. The Lord closed her womb. If you stop there, then we've got a lot of questions, right? But it doesn't stop there. And so, we need to have a mindset of appreciation for praying. So we pray for one another. If we really believe in prayer, if we really appreciate then we will pray for one another. James 5.16 we will pray for deliverance from evil. The evil one is out there. Ephesians 6 clearly tells us that, that we're at war. And so we need to be in prayer. We need to pray that we are in line with God's will. We need to pray for His protection from temptation. We, we need to pray for forgiveness. We pray for, for our spouse. We pray for our country, our government. Woo. We pray for everything. So there should never be an end to our prayer list. There should never be an unceasingly lack of praying because we have much to pray for and much hope in our prayers. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Hannah. Thank You for her example to us, not only as a, a mama-to-be,